So first of all, welcome to all of you. I'm sorry that we're a little delayed, but we're really fortunate um, that the director was able to, with the commissioner, participate in an event with our uh, state, with our senator, our mayor, our governor at Fairhaven, uh, with the groundbreaking of the new building at the Fairhaven Community Health Center. I'm Howie Foreman from the Department of Radiology. Uh, and on behalf of the Department of Radiology and the School of Public Health, I really want to welcome all of you and appreciate your patience. Uh, we have a great ev event ahead of you. Um, this is a collaboration between the Department of uh, Radiology and the Bora Foreman Lecture, uh, as well as the Yale School of Public Health, the Dean's Lecture Series. Uh, this could not have happened without the sincere and complete support of, of both of those entities. And at this time, there's a million people I'd like to thank, but for the most part, I want to thank our speakers today, and I'll do so uh, now. Um, uh, I'm going to hand it over in a minute to our commissioner to introduce our speakers. I'm also grateful to our Dean, Megan Ranney. I'm grateful to Mandy Cohen, who is our Yale alum, who committed to this event seven months ago. And we thought it would be a, a few little simple, small events, uh, and then things intervened. I'm also convinced that she uh, and our other guests have helped us avoid a government shutdown because otherwise we couldn't have done this. Um, uh, also thankful the Solomon Center at the Yale Law School uh, under Abby Gluck and the Yale Medical Council uh, with leadership from Wilton Sun have been really instrumental in making us be able to pull this event off. I uh, can't uh, thank all the CDC staff, but I do want to particularly thank Ursula Schell uh, for her work um, in collaborating on this event. So Dr. Manisha Jutani, who will soon take the microphone and introduce our speakers, is a Yale faculty member on leave. Uh, having taken on the enormous responsibility of commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Public Health, a position that she has held over, over these last two years, including helping us steer through the end of the pandemic. Dr. Jutani is a world-renowned infectious disease clinician and scholar and has been a forceful ad advocate for the ideal of healthcare as a human right. Uh, her work is infused with a commitment to health equity. as She helps us tackle some of the greatest public health challenges of our lives, She's a graduate of Penn, Cornell, and trained partly at Yale before joining our faculty. Uh, I will turn it over to her, and I want to just thank everybody in advance. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you very much for that introduction, Dr. Foreman. And it's a great honor to be back at Yale, as always, and to be here with these esteemed speakers here today. So I want to introduce our two speakers. Our first is Dr. Mandy Cohen, who is the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the administrator of the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. She's one of the nation's top health leaders with experience leading large and complex organizations and a proven track record protecting Americans' health and safety. Dr. Cohen received her bachelor's degree from Cornell her Doctor of Medicine from right here, Yale School of Medicine. Great to welcome her back. I'm sure that's when she befriended Howie. And um, you know, her master's in public health from the Harvard School of Public Health. She trained in internal medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Cohen led the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, where she was lauded for her outstanding leadership during the COVID crisis focusing on equity, data accountability, and transparent communication. She also transformed the North Carolina Medicaid program through the state's Medicaid expansion and her focus on whole person health with the launch of the country's first statewide coordination platform, NC Care 360. Prior to joining CDC, Dr. Cohen served as the executive vice president at Allidade the CEO of Allidade Care Solutions, and Dr. Cohen was involved in many aspects of the Affordable Care Act policy development and implementation during her time serving as Chief Operating Officer and Chief of Staff of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, as well as Acting Director of the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight. It's with this outstanding background that we are so fortunate to have her now leading the CDC. And now to Dr. Megan Rainey who is the Dean of the Yale School of Public Health and the CEA Winslow Professor of Public Health. She's an emergency physician, researcher, and national advocate for innovative approaches to public health. Dr. Rainey earned her bachelor's degree from Harvard, her medical doctorate from Columbia, and her master's degree in public health from Brown. She completed her residency in emergency medicine and fellowship in injury prevention research at Brown University, and she was previously a Peace Corps volunteer. 
Prior to arriving at Yale, Dr. Rainey served as Deputy Dean at the Brown University School of Public Health, the Warren Alpert Endowed Professor of Emergency Medicine at Alpert Medical School of Brown University, and was the founding director of the Brown Lifespan Center for Digital Health. Dr. Rainey's research focuses on developing, testing, and disseminating digital health interventions to prevent violence and related behavioral health problems, such as well as on the COVID-related risk reduction. She's held multiple national leadership roles, including co-founding and senior strategic advisor for the American Foundation for Firearm Injury Reduction in Medicine at the Aspen Institute, a nonprofit committed to ending the gun violence epidemic through a nonpartisan public health approach and being co-founder of Get Us PPE, a startup nonprofit that delivered don and donated and delivered PPE to those who needed it most. She is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. It's really an honor to have them both here today. I'd like to say as all of us, all three of us being mother of two women, as women being mothers of two children each. <laughs> Got tongue, tongue, tongue on my words. But you know, it's really remarkable to see these women in leadership with this outstanding background. And we are so excited to hear their conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jitan. So thank you for joining us today. I do want to apologize again for the wait. Thank you for your patience. Great things come to those who wait. Um, and thank you, Dr. Cohen, for joining us all the way from Atlanta. In my conversations with faculty, staff, and students, I know how much so many of you have been looking forward to this day. I know there are many others who are unable to attend in person, but are looking forward to watching the recording on Zoom. And we're grateful for your coming back to New Haven, a place that you once called home. So as you all know, I launched the Leaders in Public Health series as one of the first event series of my deanship here at Yale School of Public Health. I, like so many of you in the audience, believe deeply in the power of extraordinary public health leaders, and I'm committed to bringing these leaders, thinkers, and doers here to Yale to share with us a little bit about their career path, lessons learned, and providing inspiration for those, particularly students, who are going to go out and be change makers themselves. As we pioneer together a new era of the Yale School of Public Health's independence, We'll continue to have speakers and collaborators that are doing work centered around inclusion and community, innovation and entrepreneurship, communication, and of course, data-driven leadership. Today's event with Mandy is only the second of what I hope will be a long series of bringing our community together across the School of Public Health, the School of Medicine, and the rest of campus. Before we get started, I do have a little surprise. Those who came to my last Dean's lecture will have a heads up. I want you to look under your seat. Eight lucky people have a small memento to remember this event. <laughs> there are some empty seats, so uh, take a look. That is so Oprah of you. <laughs> Who got them? Got them. Show us your show thing. us show us your the the show little us. swag. There you go. <laughs> got some mugs <laughs> in the back Hi. down here. Excellent. So congratulations to you, a, a memory of Dr. Cohen's visit. Bye. So without further ado, I'm gonna move us into the discussion. Dr. Cohen, it is such a privilege and an honor to have you here. We're honored, we got to share the stage sometimes over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. I've long been an admirer and an acquaintance, and I'm just really thrilled to have you here joining us today. Thank you. So I'm going to start at the beginning, not going back to the beginning of your time here at Yale, but rather the beginning of your time as uh, North Carolina Secretary of DHHS. I call that out because, as Dr. Juthani can no doubt attest, there are some unique things that you learn in public health as the head of a state health agency. I wondered if you'd mind sharing with our esteemed group of students, faculty, and staff uh, how your understanding of public health and the role of that intersection of government, private sector, and nonprofits mm. change over your tenure as secretary. Sure. Well, first, before I, oops, can you all hear me? Um, before I dive in, I just, I do want to say thanks for having me back. It's wonderful to be back in New Haven, and it's been a wonderful day of being at the Fairhaven uh, Clinic and seeing them do a groundbreaking and they're expanding what they're doing. Um, and, I, you know, I think that my education here at Yale was really pivotal for, for me. It allowed 
me as a student to, to think big. And it was the first time where folks said, um, it's okay to, to think about how do we want the world to be different and how are you going to fit into that space? Um, as a first year medical student, Yale um, supported us to go over to South Africa, a bunch of, of students and actually get hands-on experience in global health, working on the HIV uh, crisis at the time. And you know, it was just the start of a journey thinking about um, where do I fit in um, to all of that? And I've been incredibly lucky um, to have taken, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to have taken some risks actually early in my career to say, I want to think about leading in the public um, public sector space. And then sometimes you also get lucky. I was also in the right place at the right time with the Affordable Care Act getting passed. Um, frankly, I was in the right place when, when CMS had entered a crisis when healthcare.gov didn't turn on. You might not, you all might be too young to remember in 2013, <laughs> that crisis. Um, but all of these are incredibly formative so that when I came to North Carolina um, in 2017, and I lived there for five years, I was brand new to North Carolina. I'm from New York originally. Um, and it was, um, you know, North Carolina is a, in a remarkable place. And, and now my, my family continues to live there. And now I'm, I'm from North Carolina now. Um, uh, after you go through leading through a crisis like COVID, um, you, you bond with the, the state, but it isn't, I loved being there, but it was, um, it was a different role going to lead at the state, um, at the state level than the work I had done at the federal government. At the state level, you both get to build much more authentic relationships. You see the problems, um, up close and personal in a different way, and, um, North Carolina is a, a challenging place to do work. We, I worked for a Democratic governor. We had a Republican supermajority in um, our legislature, so a divided government. Um, we were, um, were very, um, have a very stark divide urban rural in, in North Carolina. And so it was, it was a really interesting place to work, but also I went there to be Secretary of Health and Human Services. So I thought that was an exciting challenge because it wasn't just the director of public health or the head of Medicaid or the head of mental health. I got to think about knitting together all of those health and human services in service of health. And we really kept that as our North Star, really. How can we deliver health for the people of North Carolina? Um, so as I think about public health, I think that's what we're trying to do, right? Is think about populations and how do we make them healthier? And what what that taught me was you cannot do that alone from public health. I think if I had tried to, to just do that from the perch of public health without having the benefit of thinking about the levers of payment through Medicaid or the service delivery in mental health or the social services that we had there, we couldn't have put together that comprehensive view of trying to drive towards health. So I felt pretty lucky that before the pandemic, I had three years of thinking about how do we buy health? I had a $20 billion a year budget, which I will say is a bigger than the CDC budget. To what big, yes, we'll get Not to that. Not kidding, we'll, sadly. We'll, yeah. we'll get to that. Um, right, so a pretty large budget when you think about all of those comprehensive services. And when you ask that question of each and every one of those levers from social services to mental health, to public health, to Medicaid, to say, how do we deliver and buy health for this state? It was pretty powerful. And so I love be being able to bring together those, those levers. So when I think about what did I learn about public health, it's a team sport. And now being able to then take that, what we were doing in terms of building towards health and then take that into the crisis of the pandemic um, was really important because that means when we went into the pandemic, we were thinking about whole person health in our response from day one. Um, and I was so lucky to work for, I think, the best governor in the country, Roy Cooper. Um, he is just, I could not have asked for a better um, boss um, and partner in, in that response work. And he called out right from the beginning that trust was gonna be the most important thing that we could focus on as we go into the crisis. How do we build trust and how do we maintain trust with the people of North Carolina? And that's really um, has shaped me as I think about public health, right? If we want the world to be different, if we want the world to be healthier, it always for me comes back time and time again to trust and trust 
yes is a feeling, but we'll, I'm sure we'll get into it, but trust is a tactical plan um, that you have to execute on every single day. And that's a lot of what I learned about leading through a public health crisis at the state level, um, and certainly um, a lot of what I bring to, to the CDC work. As, um, I'm three, three months in now. I, I love that, the idea of trust being a tactical plan. You and I were just talking about kind of the challenge of so much of public health is thinking about you know, who are the community partners? How do we define the problems? How do we describe accurately the breadth, depth, and hotspots? But then you have to have a plan for what to do afterwards. And that's the other side of public health that we so often don't talk about, but that I think is one of the special sauces of certainly the YSM, YSPH collaboration, the collaboration of YSPH with our School of Management here, um, and, and thanks to Howie as well, the combination, the, that collaboration between the med school and the School of Management. In terms of, I'm going to go on that trust theme. Um, you know, we all cheered you on when you got the directorship of the CDC. It's just such an incredible honor, and I can't imagine anyone better in this country to lead the organization. I know that recreating trust has been a linchpin of what you've been talking about. You wrote a recent editorial in the New York Times trying to recreate trust in vaccines and talking about how you were getting yourself as well as your children vaccinated. I would love to, for you to share a little bit about how you think about that work within the CDC, as well as some of your other hopes and dreams um, for your directorship at the CDC. Sure. I feel like I got a master class in thinking about trust, like I said, working for, for Governor Cooper and leading through the COVID crisis. And what I took away from that around the tactical plan for trust are really three buckets of, of, of work. The first is transparency. The second is simplicity in operations, and I'll get to that, or, or great execution. And the third is relationships. Um, so on the first is transparency. I think the the critical linchpin of public health is to bring visibility, data, and evidence to trying to solve how we protect health, whether it's identifying and responding to a re respiratory virus or our first uh, cases of domestically acquired malaria, which we had this year um, in first in 20 years, or it's understanding overdoses from different types of uh, fentanyl or xylosine, right? Uh, having that data, that transparency um, is critical to building trust. So transparency for us was absolutely fundamental. And what what's hard as, uh, about transparency is science is constantly evolving, as we know. We are learning more things. So it's really critical to be able to say, this is what I know, this is what I don't know. And importantly, this is what I'm working on to, to know, and I'll come back to you. And you can trust that this, this public health is not a black box. Um, and I can't tell you still, um, I was just with a, a round table of reporters yesterday who said that public health is a black box to us. Help us understand it better. We want to be your champions, but we don't understand it. Let us in. All right. So transparency, I think, builds trust. And in North Carolina, leading through the COVID crisis, we did a press conference every day at two o'clock for six months. And then we did it every other day for another six months. And then we did it three times a week or two times a week. For that. Right. We did 170 press conferences. Um, I never thought I'd be that person pointing to charts and graphs on a, <laughs> on a television every day. But but that transparency, that that being there, willing to take questions is really, really important. And public health needs to both, I think, have simple and clear messages, transparency in its data um, as, as we're doing work. Okay, that's one. Then second, and this is, I really feel strongly about, in, in North Carolina, I was not only the person who was helping the public understand the science and the data for why we were making certain decisions, I was also responsible for the execution or the operations of the response. Were there tests in my community? Was there PPE for folks? Was there vaccine when you said it was going to be there, right? The execution, because we can talk and help people understand it. But if they go in and, and try to get a vaccine and they've taken an hour off of work and their appointment got canceled, we've missed an opportunity. And we can study vaccines and their effectiveness, but if they sit on the shelf, they're not effective. And message is part of that, communications that's simple and trusted, but it's also the operations and the execution. And for me, I'm an operator. You heard I was chief operating officer at, at CMS, the largest payer in, in the country. 
And so I, I really feel like operations and I want, I want public health to make sure that they feel accountable and ownership over those operations because we can't make folks and help folks protect themselves if we both don't get the operations right. And then the third is relationships. We, we're all humans at the end of the day. And it is remarkable about how sometimes we forget that. And sitting down with folks and building relationships which takes time. And I will say the power of showing up cannot be um, understated. Um, we spend a lot of time showing up in communities that were historically marginalized. Showing up and listening um, was so important to trust building, to relationship building. I was lucky to have had three years of relationship building across the aisle before we went into the crisis. And that was really important um, so that we had a foundation, um, but we had to nurture that foundation through the crisis. And it's why we had 99% of our seniors got vaccinated in North Carolina. North Carolina Extraordinary. voted to elect Donald Trump twice, um, right? So it doesn't have to be partisan. No. Um, I think that there, we tried to show a way where um, where we could come together. We had all four of the de two Democratic and two of our top Republican leaders, all four of them did a vaccine video for us saying get vaccinated, right, in North Carolina. So we got to that place because of relationships, but also because of transparency and good execution and answering questions. But that relationship piece is critical. And that's that's a Roy Cooper taught me that for sure. How lucky you are, I will say, having worked, having spent 20 years in, in Rhode Island, where Gina Raimondo was our most recent she's governor. Great. She's yeah. extraordinary. It is amazing to watch these folks that know how to get things done. And I will say you are one of them who I have enjoyed watching get things done. So you alluded in that answer to two things um, that I know are, have both been longtime foci of your career, but also are key to your work at CDC. One is around data and accuracy of data and accurate capture of demographics so that we can address equity and pay attention to the historically marginalized communities that are experiencing disproportionate burden of disease. The other is around community. And I think back to your work at Doctors for America um, as an exemplar. I would love to hear your reflections on either or both of those. Sure. Thinking about both kind of that data equity issue, how you, I mean, really to me, what you did in North Carolina with getting demographic data um, accurately measured was just transformative, um, how you're thinking about that on a national level, and then how you you take those lessons from DFA uh, forwards. Sure. Well, first, I'm a data girl. Um, and so I think that data is the oxygen that powers our work, particularly in public health. If you can't see problems, you can't solve problems. Um, we know that there are disparities in our system, but until you get that accurate data, there's a lot of hand waving of, uh, you know, that's not my patient. That's not my, th right. Um, <laughs> so that clear, crisp data that changes action is really necessary. Um, so let me talk about what we did in, in North Carolina. Well, we, we said equity was at the center of what we were doing. And so we, it was just unacceptable to us to not be able to stratify every piece of data that we had by race and ethnicity. Um, we did it for gender and age too. And so you couldn't log a vaccine in North Carolina without, um, without race and ethnicity. And we had 99% completion on our race and ethnicity data. Um, we won, won awards for that. I'm very proud of that work. And people fought us on it, said, oh, patients don't want to answer that, or our, it'll be too slow for our systems. We managed through it, right? We, we came up with a bunch of technology solutions, but patients want to answer that question, or frankly, why are they answering that question? It's in the EHR already, guys. Let's pull it out, right? So it was, how do we think about common sense solutions to make that possible, but then we have to use the data, right? I think a lot of times, yeah. frankly, in public health, I love, I love you all, but parsimony, <laughs> parsimony is not always our strong suit. And we just, just one more piece of data, one more question, one more piece of data. We all have to collect race and ethnicity in the same way every time for every program. So we have apples to apples comparison against across every program. It seems super basic, but we don't do it at the CDC right now. Guess who well, you're, you're also on. kind of not allowed to do it, right? <laughs> There's some data use agreement issues. I, yeah. don't, I don't think we can get past that. So I, I don't that. like to tolerate that, right? And so I'm always a, how do we find a way, mm -hmm. right? But so this is where I also um, think we have to, um, one, um, expect that, but then we have to use that data for action, right? And so it wasn't just the collecting of it. 
then we're just admiring the problem, right? <laughs> it's it's the changing action. And what was powerful about it is that when we were responding to the, the crisis on a day-to-day -day basis, we were looking at that information and we said, why, why aren't vaccines over there? Why are, why is that community at a lower rate that, that Latino community over there at a lower rate? Let's deploy resources over mm -hmm. there. Or you pick up the phone and say, did you know, did you know this is happening? Right. And so you have to make that actionable and it's a self, um, self reinforce. Yeah. yeah. So when you're actually using it and people are like, oh, this is so useful. Now I want to collect the data. No, no questions asked. So it's great. Last thing I'll say on data, though, that we're doing is in addition to standardization on how we collect so it, it's it's most useful, um, we have to, all of us, no matter where we sit, whether it's CDC or academia um, or the health systems, we have to get away from the mindset of this data is mine. Mm. There is a lot of, I've, well, I've, I've done the hard work of collecting this data and and. I, I get to publish and, from and it. Yeah. I'm going to publish yeah. my data. And, and I, I appreciate that. I like, but particularly I'm working on with it, CDC and with our state partners, um, we have to move away from the data is mind mindset. Data is a national security asset, right? It's how we are going to protect this nation um, as we go forward. And we have to find ways to be able to share that data um, across the board. Um, we did it for COVID. If we can do it for COVID, we should do it across the board. We have to do it for COVID and flu and RSV. Let's start there. So right now we have great data sharing and visibility. So if you want to know what's happening with COVID in your backyard, you can know it. But you don't know about flu. You don't know about RSV in the same way. We're we're working to change that. And I'm working with our state partners, right? Because to your point, there are different authorities and, and such. But we have to move ourselves towards that 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 path. And I'm, I'm looking for a coalition of the willing to go on down that path um, with me. And then I'll work with Congress um, to show why with that power, what, why that's so necessary. Um, and that's needing help from our health systems as well. So the data is mind mindset has to go. We need that data to power healthy communities. Um, and so we're, we need to move quickly in that, in that direction. Love that. So I'm going to do one more question and then I'm going to open it up. Um, Dr. Juthani, I'm sure, is both ready to be a coalition of the willing, but also we're excited for her to moderate questions. So my last question is a slightly more personal one, knowing that this is a room of staff, faculty, and students who came here to be inspired and to learn a little bit about your journey. It's kind of a question about if you had the chance to go back in time or you, know, you have the opportunity now to speak to a bunch of aspiring leaders themselves, what do you wish you had learned? What are you thankful you learned? What do you encourage the folks in the room to pursue um, as future public health leaders? So two pieces of advice um, that I've been giving um, for, for a while now. Some One which I think I followed and one which I was disappointed I didn't. <laughs> so I'll do the good, the good first. Um, is be uncomfortable. Hmm. Um, I had this opportunity, my, my career has, some, like now I can go back and tell like this nice story about You're here. how it made sense, <laughs> but my career like zigzagged a bit um, in terms of was this the right step for me? And what I realize now in hindsight is that building differentiated kinds of skill sets allowed me to open doors to different kinds of opportunities. So if I had just taken jobs that were fit for a doctor, um, I don't think I would have been able to make the progress in my career. There were times where I was the communications lead. There was times where um, I was the data lead. There were times when, when my, it was my clinical expertise that mattered. There was sometimes it was my policy expertise. Sometimes I was just needing to be a good manager. Um, and so building different kinds of skill sets, but that does require you to step out of your comfort zone. Um, sometimes crisis pulls you in that direction. And I would say sometimes crisis is an opportunity. Um, so think about moments of big change. For me, like I said, when healthcare.gov didn't turn on, that was a big crisis moment for the organization I was with. I got to step out dramatically from where I was. I was doing physician payment models, pretty typical what you know what folks would be thinking of where I went to work to run the call run a call center. <laughs> right. So that was a hard conversation to have with my mom when she was like, what are you doing running a call center? Um, right. But and I was uncomfortable. I was like, I don't know anything about a call center, but you know what? It was a fantastic 
learning experience to dive into something I didn't know, think about leadership and management, right? And and that allowed me to start opening my mind a bit about skill building in different ways. So be uncomfortable. Second, the other part is about asking great questions in whatever environment you're in. And I feel like this is where I fell down. Looking back now, I think there were moments where I didn't take advantage of opportunities to ask questions of people I was around because I wanted everyone to think I already knew the answers, <laughs> right? Everyone wants I to- I can't imagine anyone in this room <laughs> feels that way. <laughs> right, you want to front and be like, I got this, yeah. uh, right? And it, I missed opportunities to really understand things earlier in my career when I should, I should have understood them earlier if I just asked good questions at the time. And I am so, I, I'm always so enamored by young students who ask really good questions. I'm like, damn, I wish I could have asked those kind of questions when I was your age. I would have been much smarter sitting in this, in the seat right now. Sometimes I had to do all the wrong things um, and learn the lesson. So ask good questions. Trust me, if you have a question, others have a question, but it's also the opportunity to learn, right? No one expects you early in your career to know all the things. So please like ask good questions. Don't feel like you have to know all the answers. And I would say that in any job, I would say the more I do in leadership, I, the way I lead is not sometimes, sometimes you need to be a directive leader, but most of the time I'm going to the team to be like, what should we do? What should we do here? I will help you do it. And my job as the leader is to break down barriers for you, right? If this is the right thing to do, I'm going to, right? If, if there's an authority problem, I'm going to fix it, right? If, mm -hmm. if there's politics we need to get through, how can I help? If we need to communicate, what can I do, right? But I'm going to go to the folks to say, what should I, what should I do? And it is to this day, the, the fact that I've been able to hone my ability to ask good questions, I think that has helped me, um, further my career. I love that. And what a beautiful segue into a chance for questions to be asked. So thank you. Thank you for sharing those, Mandy. I think that's lovely. And, and I do really want to kind of double click on, on the idea that careers are not straight lines. And so for those who are sitting out in the audience wondering what their next step is, to, to not hesitate to take that risk and to not feel like you have to have it all figured out now. I feel like particularly for kind of our newer generation, there's this sense that you need to know on the day when you start your graduate program, what you're going to do next. And I don't, maybe you knew you were going to do internal medicine or public health, but I sure surprised myself. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Juthani. Thank you both. We want to have an opportunity for people to be able to ask questions. There are microphone rovers in the room. So if anybody has a question, feel free to raise your hand at this time. We have a few in the front here. Hi, Dean Ranny and Dr. Cohen, thank you so much for being here. I wanted to um, get your thoughts on online misinformation and disinformation as a public health threat. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, a little teeny topic, yeah. very small. Yeah. If you, so I know as early as, as recent as last year, DHS tried to launch a disinformation governance board and that ultimately failed. Um, and we know a lot of disinformation is rooted in fear and misinformation. Um, so how, what is the appropriate strategy to neutralize it, right? If there aren't any financial incentives or if the political incentives aren't even there. So what can everyone do to combat that? Yes. Um, I think this is a really important topic. So a couple of ways that I thought about, about this, right? So I think those of us with the good information need to drown out the bad information, right? It's a flood the zone approach. Um, so that so much good information is out there that the misinformation is, is, is muted. But understand that in order for us to get good information out, we have to understand how folks are consuming that information and they're consuming it as entertainment. And we are not entertaining. <laughs> I wish I was, um, right? <laughs> to but, us, you are. <laughs> um, so let's let's just be honest. And I think we have to meet folks where they are and think about different ways to communicate the good information. So one, we have to just do more of it, right? If everyone here sees some misinformation and then tweets the right information or sorry, X, ugh, um, <laughs> uh, threads, get on threads, folks. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so... So, right, right. And we need to, like, we can't, you are complicit if we just like let that stand. 
Um, so we need to flood the zone with the good information, but we also have to flood it with information that feels engaging to folks. Um, and I'm to, to be honest, like I think we're all still figuring this out and how to do this well. How and and like I think the government particularly has a lot of challenges doing that for a lot of not good reasons, but some good reasons. Um, and so we're we need to figure out how how to engage better. Um, far too often, and I was saying this this morning to the team at at the Fairhaven Clinic, um, you know, my the the team at CDC, I love them. They're so smart. And they're they're like, I'm so proud. I put some fantastic information up on our website. I'm like, oh boy, I haven't gone to a website for information. I don't know when, right? And I can't, I I love public health and I go to the right. So that's not going to be good. And that's not good enough. We have to modernize the way we communicate as a strategy related to disinformation. Then there's a whole regulatory architecture that we need to think about. I am 100% fully supportive of free speech, but I think there's nothing about free amplification that I that we need to think about. And so there, there's something there in the middle where we can we can everyone can say the things they want to say, but they don't all need to be amplified in a way. And, and there's again, but that's in the world of laws and, and, and regulations that folks need to really think about that's broader than even just public health information. It's bigger than that. Um, so what we can do in healthcare and public health um, is to flood the zone with good information. We can be engaging. Um, we can be trusted. Um, and yes, people get their information from social media, but the most trusted folks at survey after survey, it's a survey, your doctor and your nurse, right? The nurse at your church and your own personal doctor. So like every time you're walking into a room with someone, you have an opportunity to influence their lives. The number one reason people don't get vaccinated, their doctor didn't mention it at the visit. Didn't say it was important. Not because they thought it was a bad. The doctor didn't mention it. They would have mentioned it if it was important. So mention it, right? So every we have to take every opportunity. We don't have, we're, I don't think we're ever going to be quite as engaging online. So like, let's take every opportunity in person that we possibly can. We have a question in the front row over here. Please. And then we'll go to the one in the back. Thank you for the opportunity. And my question is for both of you. Part of the answer may be that both of you are here. So uh, we are aware that I always assume that all of us know the importance of the relation between institutes such as CDC with academic research institutes like, like Yale. So uh, if you can elaborate more on this collaboration and relationship, like to inform the, the, the decisions and the policies, and also like, what would you do different to strengthen such collaboration and relationship? Thank you. Well, obviously the, our academic partners are incredibly important to, to train the, the future, the current and future leaders of, uh, of public health. So very important as we're thinking about what are those skill sets that folks need to build. But there's also really important questions that get answered in academia. And we saw it, frankly, during the pandemic, case number one of like um, our, our academic partners being trusted voices um, to share really good information um, and, and so, so critical. But it's also about prioritization together and having a shared agenda on what are we trying to accomplish. I think there's more work we need to do there between public health and academia. What are the things that CDC needs to research and do? What are the things that academia, that CDC can't do, that academia could do um, in different ways? I don't think we have as much of a of a unified shared agenda as we need to. I think that's that's on the, the to-do list. I'm only a few, we're, you know. Yeah. And, we're both a couple yeah. of months in. Yeah, get to <laughs> getting to it, right. But we, we need to do that because I think there are certain things CDC needs to stop doing. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are certain things that academia needs to pick up to do, but what, right? And, but we have to have that, um, collaboration back and forth to be like, okay, if you've got this, then we're gonna we're we're gonna not, and we'll go over there because there's so many important things we all need to do. There's too much work in the world, right? So I think there's more more work we need to do. But I mean, I, Dean, it, over to you. Exactly what you just said. I think that we think of ourselves at, we can think of ourselves as extenders of each other's skill sets. We do sit in slightly different places within the ecosystem of public health and healthcare. And so, how do we work in partnership? 
to do the things that maybe CDC or our state and local health departments wish they could do, but can't. They don't have the staff, they don't have the infrastructure, maybe they don't have the very specialized expertise, and then vice versa, our partnership back, CDC and state and local health departments have an unbelievable platform to disseminate to implement, to actually change policies and procedures on the ground, um, and have an incredible workforce that is present in almost every community uh, across the United States. And then if we look globally, certainly there are partnerships there as well. And so knowing kind of how then on our side, the information gets shared and made actionable is huge. The, the last part that I'll say that I see is an existing source of partnership that we can grow is around grants, um, around support of not just research, but also implementation. For those who aren't aware, CDC is a tremendous funder of not just research, but also on the ground uh, implementation work. And I think that it behooves us as academics to think about how we can be better partners in, in that space um, as well. But the shared agenda is something that I'm excited to, to work on going forward. And I think we're going to have a bunch of opportunities to think a little differently as we move into this new ecosystem of public health and health care about how we can amplify and extend each other's work. Question in the back, I believe. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, Dr. Don, so nice to have you here. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Noor al -Zabi. I'm a first year um, at the Yale School of Public Health. So my question actually has two parts. Um, first, I'm just wondering what are some of the strategies adapted from COVID that are kind of being used to be implemented in the future or the preparedness phase for like any future pandemic? Um, second part is actually one that I'm very interested in. I'm just wondering if there has been any initiatives or your review on preparing um, programming or any other kind of part of initiatives to address immigrant um, health issues in the United States um, and what would that look like in the upcoming years? Great. So on the first, in terms of lessons learned from COVID, there are so many <laughs> So many, but I'll, I'll go back to some core ones, which is we need data infrastructure to see issues and solve problems. Um, I think we, uh, my first effort as North Carolina secretary was an effort we called kill the facts. And that's because we were getting <laughs> lab data by facts. Ugh, ugh when we went into a historic pandemic. So I had 250 people entering information into a computer until we killed the facts. But right, so we've built systems now, fantastic, but we built them for COVID. Mm -hmm. But there's some railroad tracks there, right? So we've laid some tracks on how to build pipes and, and think about this. And so CDC is being funded for a huge data monetization effort. That's across CDC, it's to the states, a lot of work being done. We have to get systems that talk to each other across healthcare and public health. So a lot, I mean, absolutely fundamentally have to do that. If we want to call this a public health system, data integration is like absolutely fundamental. Then there is all of the work related to how we recognize public health as a team sport. We saw how we needed to bring in different folks and clarifying roles and responsibilities in peacetime versus crisis time. What are the right roles and responsibilities for the health delivery system? I will say in North Carolina, our, our major hospital systems were hugely important and, and I, I give huge credit to them. I would convene these competitors, right? They're business competitors across our state. I'd convene them every Monday morning to make sure that we were aligned and executing. Um, but that's not the, the norm, right? That, that's in crisis. So how do we think about roles and responsibilities not in crisis as well? Um, and then the, the communication and trust building. You can't build trust in a crisis. You have to be there throughout. So the trust building has to start now for a crisis we may have 10 years from now right, in the communities that we need to be in. So I heard an interesting point this morning at Fairhaven that, um, you know, we're spending a lot of, of effort on the mental health crisis. And they said, you know what, more than the mental health crisis, we're actually seeing dental health as one of the most significant needs for the community here. And I was like, oh, well, one, oh, that's so hard. Um, and, but so important. So like, let's start, like, let's listen as leaders, right, to that's how you build trust. You listen to what are the community's first top priorities. Let's solve that. So then in five years, if we have another crisis, hopefully not, um, that 
we've, we're there, we're solving problems that matter to the community. So like we have, like now is where, when we have to do the preparation. And in terms of um, our um, immigrant communities, what I, I love about public health and, and I'm so proud of CDC and only being there three months, I take no credit for this, but it is honestly the most equity focused um, organization that I had have, have been part of. And I'm very proud of the North Carolina work, but it was a lot of like new work when I come to CDC and I see it, the equity work is embedded everywhere in a great way. And they think about populations and um, po they, they are thinking about um, migrants and, and their health at all times and thinking about how do we make sure we're understanding what they need and, and think about it. So for example, I was just on the phone with folks in, in New York um, who are, are seeing a lot of um, new immigrants and migrants um, that are, are there and how can we help them with it from an infectious disease place, but also from housing and things like that. So CDC, like that's, I give them a ton of credit um, for doing incredible work. The resources are what is missing there. It's not the passion. It's not the, the, the strategy. It's resources in order to make sure that we can help all those communities. And if I can just jump in real two things. One is around the migrants. It is just to put a finer point on that partnerships. Um, I recently had a lovely conversation uh, with the head of health and human services in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. They're also struggling with the same problem. And it really is the partnerships that it's not all on DHHS um, helping to provide uh, a, a livelihood and a life um, to allow folks to start to integrate. So often, right, we think about health as sitting off in this bubble versus being part of this much larger ecosystem of, of issues and things that help to create health. The other thing is you were talking about the data modernization initiative. Going back to your question, something that we can do in academia is to help tell the story of why CDC matters and of why their initiatives matter. So I bring up the data modernization initiative anytime I talk to a policymaker. CDC has asked for 165 million more or less, more than that, that you, you're going up. You're going up from Michelle's estimate. Okay, that's less than it costs to put Epic into one hospital system. Yeah, that's why my number's bigger. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, but but just to kind of put that in context, people don't think about it. If you're talking to policymakers, they don't think about data as core to public health the way that we do. And so we have that chance to tell the story. We also have the chance to tell the story of why CDC matters why this work matters in those community relationships and to help create the connections that then allow you to hear that dental health is the primary concern of the community that's being treated at this major FQHC in New Haven. So just as a, an addition to, to the beautiful question that you asked earlier and Noor, thank you. Dr. Cohen, we are killing the facts in Connecticut. We Thanks. haven't quite killed it, but your <laughs> data modernization <laughs> efforts are helping us get there. Okay, we have, I know several other questions I saw. Okay, right here on the front. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Uh, I had a question on behalf of a person I know who's on dialysis and they were wondering why it's not required for healthcare workers to wear N95 respirators in healthcare settings, especially um, when decades of research showed that respirators are more effective than surgical masks at preventing airborne diseases and uh, with like 60% of COVID infections asymptomatic and hospital acquired infections four times uh, higher, have a four times higher risk of mortality. So great question. So we have different teams who um, are, are looking at, at some of these issues right now and I think updating some of the guidance, right? So I think you want to look at, a, we look at a couple of factors when thinking about it. Sure. Is an N95 going to certainly filter out more things than a surgical mask? Yes. We know how those work, right? If you have something that's fit tested and 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 the, the different material. So, but the question is, what are the things that you need to wear an N95 for? And what are the things where surgical barrier masks make, make sense? And you want to look both at the way um, the in, infection is spread, but also what is the risk? Right. So we spread, you know, a lot of things that are are aerosolized, but they're, they're different levels of risk. Um, it is it is good news in 2023 where we are related to covid. Ninety seven percent of us have either had it or have been vaccinated um, by it. So we aren't in the same place we were in 2020 when we had an entire population that's never been exposed. Now, I wouldn't, I have to be on brand for CDC director. I'm glad we got to this. Um, our, our, our immunity is going down. The virus is changing. Please all get your updated COVID vaccine. <laughs> Even those of us who are, I, I'm, I'm 
I almost was saying I'm as young as you, I'm not. I'm getting my vaccine, but please, every, everyone at every age should get it as well as your flu shot. But my point is, is that we have to think about levels of risk for all of those different kinds of diseases versus in, in terms of what is the protection level that we need. Um, and so, so those are the kinds of research that the team goes through. We actually have an independent advisory committee that is going through some of that work um, right now to understand the data and what it, how, do you, how do you map to um, the, right, the right protection because it's both how how is it how is it transmitted but also like what is the risk to all all of the, the patients and we sort of need to balance all, all of those things yeah great thank you i know there are a few others uh right behind the last person who asked hi um thank you for being here i this question is addressed to both of you but it's based on something that dr cohen said um you said earlier that Data is a national securities asset, and we need to move away from a data is mine mindset. And so I was wondering whether you think there's a place for the CDC or just general U.S. health policy to maybe require this data sharing, um, especially in the realm of public health, because it's so important to just our general health in general for the whole uh, country. Yeah, the short answer is yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, and I talk about it with with members of Congress whenever I have a conversation with them. Um, now, I understand why um, th th we have to have a balance here, just like balance in the last question I was talking about. We wanna collect data to have that visibility. We need to protect privacy. Absolutely, I, I think that is important too. A lot of the data that can be actionable can be de-identified in the way that we collect it um, and, and use it and it still be actionable. There are some places where that shouldn't be true um, in terms of case identification. But those are the things we're trying to work through with Congress and help them understand de-identified data is what we're really talking about as the asset that we need to understand and respond to threats. And I think we're making some progress there. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, these modernized data systems and all, they're expensive. Also, just candidly, data is a um, uh, gives you uh, market power. Um, in the healthcare system. And so, you know, there, there are different forces that pull upon this. So we're going to try to tell the story of why we need um, this data. I am spent most of my career on the health delivery side. We have to do this in a way that is not burdensome to the health delivery system. We, we need to pull and extract the data out of EHRs. We cannot ask for additional manual work for folks. So this is where my, I'm wearing my CMS hat um, for, for a second, right? Their CMS you know, has a lot of mechanisms in which we collect data already. Public health needs to fit into that mechanism. So we need to make sure it's not burdensome. We need to make sure that, that the privacy is protected. But yes, additional authorities are absolutely needed to keep the country safe. And, and that gets to your simplicity precept around trust, which is that we have to make it really easy for people to gather, share, and use data. I will say that there is actually, uh, any of you who have CDC, NIH, or NSF-funded grants know that we are already expected to share data, to deposit whatever data we can in a shared data repository, um, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, once you have removed those markers of privacy. I also think, to your point around that, that privacy and ethical question, it's why it's so important for us to think about this being done not on an individual basis, but on an individual locality basis, but across states, regions, and the country. Because what we often find is that some of our smallest groups, their data gets suppressed over and over. So it limits our ability to look with granularity, to Mandy's earlier point about data equity, at, for example, um, uh, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander populations, because in a given locale, the numbers may be so small that then it becomes identifiable. So it's it's a way to think about kind of improving equity as, as well as data sharing. Um, but I'm, I'm deep, this goes back to your work in North Carolina. You were so committed to creating spaces where that, even if perhaps the full data set couldn't be shared, that the summaries of the data could be. Um, which which allows access in, in other ways. And then I think helped you to be a convener um, of data sources. And, uh, yes. yeah. and I was gonna say, I, I love, um, we have amazing scientists at the CDC and they are, are incredible, they want precision. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's not gonna be possible in the messy world that we live in. And so I'm um, thinking about, well, if we can't collect everything, what what's half a loaf? I'll take that for, to start. Um, so we're trying to get get to that place. 
Okay, we've got about six minutes left, so I'm gonna try to take two, but let's take one question. Uh, there was one in the back there, and then we'll try to come back here to the front if we can fit it in, in the back. Hello? Oh, hello. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Dr. Cohen. I can only imagine your busy schedule and taking the time to be here for us is very... Um, gratitude instilling, but thank you. My name is Lena Jones. I'm a third year in Yale undergrad, and I wanted to ask about how, as a woman of data, you plan for data's ethical use, because I know that there's this long history of data being collected and intended for wonderful purposes, and then that its actual application ends up harming the communities that it was most intended to serve. Yeah. Um, great question. This is part of the you need to protect privacy as we go, right? So a lot of times we can do this, uh, do the data collection um, without making sure that we're identifying any individual. That's that's um, the first. But I think this goes to deep seated de decades upon decades where the structural way in which we both collect and use data there as we know, there is racism built into our structures. And so then when we take take the even the way we collect data, um, be have having disparities built into it, and then we try to use these new tools like AI or our large language models, like we perpetuate those uh, disparities. So we have to really be thinking about it proactively in the front end. But honestly, when I hear your question, it al always goes back to trust, right? Is are we having the conversation on the front end? And helping the community see is like when we ask these questions and we're collecting this data, it's to help come back to you, to make sure that it's better and actually deliver on that. Um, it's it's why knowing that dental is the most important I issue here is really powerful. So we could be off collecting data on COVID vaccines, but everyone's like, well, really? Why aren't <laughs> you collecting data on what's going on related to my oral health, right? And so I think it's also having those trusting conversations with folks and then also making sure that you're always being value add and we have to check ourselves in public health because I think we come in with a lot of idealistic um, thoughts about what a community needs mm -hmm. um, and that we really need to make sure we're taking a beat to listen. And here I'll just say if this is an issue that interests you check out Data Haven which is a local organization run by one of our YSPH graduates Mark Abraham that does a lovely job collecting sharing and empowering communities to use um, local data around health. So a lovely example. Great. Yeah. Oh, it's super cool. It's super cool. <laughs> okay. We have time for one quick last question right here in the front, please. Last question. Hi. Okay. I will make it quick. Uh, hi, I'm Rachel. I'm a second year at the Yale School of Public Health. I actually worked for the commissioner over the summer. So it's great to see you all in person. Uh, my question is, what do you see as the role of the CDC in advancing whole person health on a national scale? Um, <laughs> and how will that dovetail the localized state efforts already in motion? Big question to end, and well, I'll go back to where um, I, I started. I actually think public health is one piece of that, um, and it has to be a team sport. Um, I think there's a lot of pieces in public health, but I'll go back to like public health is not resourced to to fulfill its current mission, which is identifying and responding to threats. Um, and so it we do, but there is a lot of public health principles that I want to map to all of the levers across healthcare. And that's not just health delivery system. As I said, social services has to be part of it. Education has to be part of it. Transportation has to be part of it. So this is a US government um, approach and frankly, gotta get the private sector, academia, right? It's a team sport here. Um, and that's, you know, for me, like that's the exciting part is how do we knit these pieces together? What I'm trying to do at CDC is make us the best collaborator we absolutely possibly could be. Now I think data is is the power behind that because like that visualization, but it's building a muscle of collaboration is different, right? How like candidly, like CDC does not have um, right now someone who owns engagement, stakeholder engagement, um, or they, we want to call it something else, but right, but doesn't have that function, right? But if we're going to be the best collaborator, and if this is a team sport, we absolutely have to build that muscle differently. So those are the kinds of things I'm working on at CDC. But we have a lot to offer in and of itself, right, with the, the data, evidence, and best practices so that we can go to someone like CMS and be like, you know what you should be paying for is X, not Y right? Or we can go to SAMHSA and say, you know what, we, we've studied this best practice in suicide prevention. This is where you should put your money. And they do. And we're doing that right now so that we're trying to model out those best 
um, opportunities for collaboration, make sure public health is strong in what it can offer in terms of data, evidence, best practices. And then that can, but don't leave it there. It has to get to the to the folks who then deliver the services so that they know how to use the data evidence best practices. And so like making those connection points is like very important to me. <laughs> um, and so we're gonna be doing a lot of that at, at the CDC, but we can't do it alone. And it'll be a, it'll be a team sport and everyone's on, on team health. So thank you. Well, I cannot think of anyone better to exemplify leadership in public health than Dr. Cohen. I cannot thank you enough on behalf of all of us. We do have a small, so a thank you to Mandy. Thank you. So I want to thank Claire, who, if those don't know her, is the brains and heart who works with Howie and allows him to have brains and heart as well. Uh, not that he didn't have them before, but thank you, Claire, for your help. And, and we have a small gift bag for you, yeah, as well as for Dr. Juthani, as a thank you to both of you, also exemplifying leadership in public health on behalf of our state. Again, just a very warm thank you to both of them for their presence, leadership, and grace. Thank you all for coming and for this inspirational conversation today.